Thank you. All right, so how many of you guys made it to Dave Arl's talk yesterday as I walked through the Valley of the Shadow Dawn? OK, good. So for those of you who didn't, um, we're still going to be touching on some of the high-level parts of web components. So I'm just not going to go as deep as Dave went. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Rob Dotson, developer advocate at Google. I work on the open web platform, but I primarily spend most of my time working on web components and this library called Polymer. And so I'm particularly interested to be working on these things right now because I think they're going to kind of just fundamentally change the way that we build our sites and our applications. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do like a high level overview of web components and what the heck these things are. We're going to talk about the ecosystem and what developers are building and actually like putting out there for us to use in our applications. And lastly, uh, I'm going to show you guys how you can join in on this if you're totally new to web components or if you're already working with them, but you just want to see some tools and things that will make you a bit faster and more productive. But I want to start with just a, like a high-level overview of what web components are. And I like to do this by first thinking about the problems that web components actually solve. So when I'm developing for the web these days, this is what I think of as like my target, right? There's, there's no longer just desktop and laptop. We've had this sort of explosion of screen sizes and different devices and different capabilities. And we're trying to build applications on these devices. But these are the tools that we're working with to build those applications. And it can often feel like our tools don't quite meet that challenge, right? We don't have these like powerful app-like primitives for, for building these cool mobile web apps. And I'll show you an example of what I mean by that. So let's consider something which should be straightforward, like building UI tabs. It's 2014. We should be able to just like crank this out. But there's no one way that we build UI tabs, even today. There's, there's myriad different options. And so if you're using a library like uh, Bootstrap or Foundation or jQuery UI, it might look like this. You might you know, grab some HTML from some documentation, drop it in your, your app, and kick it off with a jQuery plugin. Uh, there are libraries out there which kind of mix HTML and JavaScript. There are libraries out there which try and do as much in JavaScript as they can. And the problem is these are all different. They're all solving the same problem. They all give me tabs, but they all do it differently. And so as developers, we're sort of constantly learning these new frameworks. We're hopping around from project to project. But what's worse is we're, we're reinventing things. We're, we're building tabs in one framework, and then because it's, inter it's not interoperable with the other framework, we've actually got to like redo that effort over here. And so this is where Web Components can hopefully come in and change things for us. And the idea with Web Components is that you should be able to build a component. You should be able to build tabs one time right, using the web platform, and then drop that into any project, regardless of the library or framework that that project is running. Because we're building this using the web platform, every library and framework that knows how to work with HTML and knows how to work with the DOM should be able to work with this element that we've created. So this is kind of the dream. And this is like readable code. right? You can look at this, and you can tell how to add a fourth tab to this thing. There's no you know, crazy library that you need to learn in advance to work with this element. So what are web components? Well, there's no like one web component technology. It's actually four different technologies, each of which is kind of cool and unique in its own way and can be used individually. When you combine these technologies together, you get this whole new component model. So I'm going to run through these really quickly. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is custom elements, which let you define new HTML and DOM tags. And the problem that it solves is this one right here. So this is a real application. This is, this is Gmail, actually. If you open your dev tools, this is what you'll see. Um, and it's not that Gmail is bad or like that they haven't done a good job or anything. I mean, Gmail is amazing, right? It's, it's an incredible application. And the problem is that HTML hasn't really kept up. And so when we want to build advanced components, we can't. And so we just turn to div, and we end up with like crazy div soup. And so this is where custom elements can hopefully come in and change that for us we should be able to take all that div soup and turn it into meaningful HTML elements. And I showed one of these earlier. I showed this paper tabs element just a second ago. But just to reiterate, you know, as you're looking at it, if you know how to work with HTML, you know how to work with JavaScript and the DOM, then you know how to work with this thing. So it's got a selected attribute up there for configuring it. And you're used to working with attributes for configuring HTML elements. If we change it to look at uh, some of the JavaScript, if we want to interact with this thing, we can use query selector. We can use add event listener to listen to the events that it fires. All the same DOM APIs that we're familiar with and that we use every day. And as I go down and I sort of like interact with this thing, you'll see that 
that selected property is changing as I'm clicking on the tabs, and that activate event is firing, the event that I've been listening to. So that's custom elements. That's the first of the four technologies. The next one I want to talk about briefly is templates. And also, later on, I'm going to show you some of the code to actually implement these, but right now, just conceptually. Uh, templates give you native client-side templating for the first time in the browser. So if you're familiar with the library like uh, Handlebars or Mustache, I mean, you've, you've already worked with templating before. And so the browser makers were like, you know, everybody needs templating, it seems. So why don't we just make a template tag, add it to the browser, and then anyone can just use this new element, right? So any content that you place inside of a template, it's inert. If you have images inside of there, video, audio, they don't go out and make HTTP requests. They just sit there until you're ready to use them. You grab the content with JavaScript and you stamp it out on your page. Really simple. Uh, the next of the four technologies that make up web components is Shadow DOM. And uh, you know, if you were at Dave's talk yesterday, you heard about Shadow DOM. It basically gives us DOM and CSS scoping. Scoped CSS for the first time in the browser, which is really amazing. And what it enables is for us to create these like, really well-sealed components that don't leak their styles out onto the page. And likewise, the styles that are already in the document can't come in and affect these components. They're completely sealed up and encapsulated. And the funny thing about Shadow DOM is that you've actually been using it for years, and you just didn't realize it. And I'll show you an example. So the video tag, the HTML5 video tag that, that we all really enjoy using, um, when you configure this thing, you give it a source attribute, you give it a controls attribute. And that controls attribute is going to add all those little buttons down there at the bottom, the play button, the scrubber, the time code, et cetera. Now, if you're wondering where those buttons come from, uh, you might think, oh, that's like C++ magic that the browser has added. Uh, but in fact, it's Shadow DOM. And if you open up the dev tools in Chrome, there's a little inspector that you can turn on. It'll say, or a little option that says, show user agent Shadow DOM. You can actually inspect your video element, and you can open that tag up, and you'll see that inside of there, there's just divs and inputs. And that's what those controls are made up of. And there's CSS that's applied to those elements. But that CSS doesn't affect anything else in your page, right? Now imagine having that same power for all of the things that you build. Imagine being able to build something as, as sealed and composable as the video element. And that's really the idea with Shadow DOM. Uh, the last of the four technologies is HTML imports, which let you load uh, element definitions into your project. And this one, it's sort of easier to, uh, to see it than for me to explain it, so I'll just show you an example. Uh, think about how you load a library like Bootstrap in your project today. You've got to have a few style tags, and you've got to get them in the right order, because if they're out of order, things are going to render weird. Uh, you've got to have jQuery before you have Bootstrap and its plugins, right? With HTML imports, this just becomes a single line. You say, I, I have a link tag, I'm, I'm doing an import with my relation type, and I'm pulling in bootstrap.html. And that document contains all of the resources that I need to work with Bootstrap. And if you're concerned about having, like, millions of, of imports all pulling things in at the same time, which is, is, a, is a good concern. You don't want to have a ton of HTTP requests in your application. We've got build tools that we've created to actually take your imports and concatenate them together. So we created a tool called Vulcanize, which is a node module. It'll find all the imports in your app and mush them down into one. If you're not so into uh, you know, working on the command line, there's also grunt versions of this and gulp versions. So quick recap. Four things that make up web components. We've got custom elements for creating new HTML elements. Templates for uh, doing native templating in the browser. Shadow DOM for scoping your CSS. And HTML imports for loading in element definitions. Now when you have all these tools at your disposal, it completely changes the way that you think about building your applications and, and pulling in third party dependencies. The new model that this enables goes something like this. If I want to use some component, let's say it's like a date picker or something like that, I first go to a site, maybe like customelements.io, which is sort of like a registry. It's kind of like NPM for web components, if you want to think of it that way. I go to this site, and I browse around until I find the component that I want. I use a package manager like Bower to pull it into my project, or maybe use something like Git to install it. Then I just import the definitions for, these, for this component that I've, I've added to my project. And then I can just start working with the HTML. I can start dropping these new custom elements into my app, composing them together because their CSS is protected. It's not leaking or anything like that. And then I end up with this toolbar all sort of neatly laid out for me.
Now, the current browser support for web components looks kind of like this. Um, as of Chrome version 36, we have shipped everything. Uh, Opera gets it all for free because they're a fork of Blink. And Firefox has shipped templates, and they have custom elements, Shadow DOM, and HTML imports behind a flag in Firefox Nightly, which is pretty cool. This is really encouraging. It looks a lot better than when I started working on web components back in 2013. But you still got a few browsers here which, which are lagging behind and, and have little to no support for web components. And that's a problem because we want developers to use these technologies today so we can get feedback while the specs are still sort of young, while we're still developing this, and we can figure out you know, the problems and, and what doesn't scale and how we can change it. And for that reason, we created this project. Uh, members of the Chrome team created this project called Polymer. And Polymer basically does two things. It polyfills web components in browsers that lack support. So like IE 10 or, or mobile Safari, something like that. Uh, we have a layer of polyfills that we can put in there. So then you can start using these cool new technologies. And the other thing Polymer does is it adds syntactic sugar using a file called Polymer.js. So this adds things like data binding, um, property observation, and a really nice declarative syntax for creating your own elements. Now, if you want to just work with the polyfills, you can. That's totally cool. You don't have to take all of Polymer. Uh, if you want to bring in the sugar as well, you know, we encourage it. It's just sort of our opinionated way of working with web components. We just think it makes it kind of more efficient, and that's why we include it. So when you've got these polyfills in place, it totally changes the support matrix. Now it's all lit up, and you know, the, the goal here is we're trying to support the last two versions of every browser that's out there. So IE 10 and above, Safari 6 and above, mobile Safari, uh, that's really the goal. So you can actually start building things with these tools and actually putting them out there into production. Now the other thing I mentioned was sugaring, right? We sugar some of the, the APIs to make it um, a little bit easier to work with components. So I wanna show some of that. For custom elements, if you're making just like a, a vanilla custom element, it looks kind of like that. So this is just vanilla web components. We're not doing anything with Polymer yet. If you want to create your own tag, you call document register element. You pass in a tag name that you're registering, and you pass in a prototype for that element. And you can hang properties and methods off of this thing. So someone can select your tag, and it actually has some behavior. In Polymer, we said, hey, we think declarative is kind of the way to go. So we created a Polymer element that actually lets you create custom elements. So you configure it with a name attribute for the tag that you're registering. And then any content you place inside of that Polymer element, that's what's going to show up on screen when someone uses your new tag. So regardless if you're using vanilla web components or you're using Polymer, when, when someone wants to go and use your element, it's the same thing. They just use the new HTML tag that you've created. Or they can use a DOM API like document create element. Now, for sugaring templates, uh, if you're working with vanilla web components, the template element is extremely straightforward. You just put some content inside of a template tag, and you grab it with JavaScript later and stamp it onto your page. Simple. In Polymer, we said, hey, every element should have a template inside of it. The content for your element just goes inside of that template. And you know, we've also added some additional sugar on top of the template tag, so it can do data binding. And you, you can have like conditional templates and uh, even like iterate over collections and stuff like that. The last bit of sugar is for Shadow DOM. If you're in vanilla web components and you want to create some Shadow DOM, it just looks like this. Say element create shadow root. That'll give you this little shadow root sort of tree that you can put your, your content, your markup, and your CSS inside of. So here I'm using inner HTML to fill my shadow tree, but it could come from a template. I could clone the content out of a template and throw it in there as well. In Polymer, to make this easier, we said, you know, we think Shadow DOM and, and building sealed components is really nice. And so we just go ahead, the content that you put inside of your template, we'll just put that in the Shadow DOM for you. So you don't have to actually call anything to make that happen. So every Polymer element that you create is sort of sealed and encapsulated by default. Now, when you have all of these tools at your disposal, it makes you look at HTML differently. And I showed this slide before, and I was like, these are the tools that we have today, and it doesn't quite feel like they're living up to the challenge. But I want you to think about if HTML looked like this instead. And really what I'm getting at is, you know, think about if we just redesigned the entire language for the mobile web, knowing the lessons that we have now. Like, if we had better app-like primitives, would it make building mobile web applications easier? Could we take something like this and actually 
build it by just composing HTML tags. So to kickstart this process, we've actually started creating element sets, which are designed for mobile web applications. You're seeing some of them here. Uh, the first of these element sets is called core elements. And these are being built right now by the Polymer team. And the idea with the core elements is that these are very general purpose elements. They're sort of meant as scaffolding for your application. So they're not highly stylized or anything like that. But they're supposed to give you bedrock that you can build upon. The first one that I want to show off is called Core Toolbar, which is just a really simple container for laying out buttons and controls. And if you're just getting started with web components, it can be a good one to start with because it doesn't really do all that much. It just lays out its children horizontally. So it's very easy to reason about. Now, if I want to use this tag, I just need to import this definition into my project. And then I just start working with this new HTML element. And I can throw a div inside of there, and that'll give me the, the title for my application. Because these elements are sealed, and they don't leak their CSS or anything like that, I can compose more elements inside of this toolbar. I can throw a core icon button inside of here and have that show up. Now I've got a little hamburger menu there. And when I get my toolbar to the place where you know, I, I like how it looks, it has all the right buttons and labels and everything, I can take all of the code for my toolbar and drop it inside of another element called core header panel. And core header panel's basically like a scaffold for your page. Its sole job is to have like an area up at the top which it designates for toolbars and an area down below for the rest of the content in your application. And what's really cool about the header panel is that it basically knows what to do with the children that are inside of it. The same way that the select tag kind of knows what to do when you put option tags inside of it, or form elements know what to do when there's inputs inside of them, header panel knows what to do when there's a toolbar inside of it. And so as the user is scrolling around my page, it's actually going to keep my toolbar pinned to the top of the document. And I'm not writing CSS or JavaScript to make that happen. These elements just know how to work together. Another you know, major part of building for the multi-device web is responsive design. And so we created this element called Core Drawer Panel, which is basically a responsive scaffold for your application. So it's got an area on one side, the sidebar, where you can you know, fill it with content. So if you, uh, you have a div, you have a drawer attribute, the content that you put inside of there ends up in that sidebar. You have another div with a main attribute, all that content ends up in your main area. Now, when you get down to a smaller screen, the drawer panel knows to just move the sidebars out of the way. So you actually don't need to write any code to make that happen. It just sort of knows to do that. And what's really cool is as you start combining these things together, the core drawer panel, the header panel, the toolbar, uh, you can actually build these whole like, mobile applications primarily just composing together HTML, because now you've got these more powerful elements to work with. So those are the core elements. They are, you know, again, structural. They're not highly stylized, but they're meant to give you, you know, bedrock to build upon. And we also have another set of elements called paper elements. These are much more stylized. Uh, they're part of Google's material design system, and they deal much more with like points of interaction with the user, where the user is going to be like touching the screen or dragging things around. Um, and so I'm not going to touch on these as much. They're, they're super cool, and you see they have all these like, cool animations and these kind of like, reactive ink effects when the user is tapping on the screen. Um, but you know, in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of like, breeze through these and instead direct you to this project that we built called Topeka. And Topeka is kind of like a flagship of what you can do with core and paper elements combined. So this is a mobile app that the Polymer team built to demonstrate you know, using all these elements together. All the animations that you're seeing, all the user interaction, basically everything that's going on on screen is all built using elements, which is pretty cool. If you're interested in checking out Topeka, uh, if you head to the Polymer Project website, it's up there. We also have a bunch of other demos that you can play around with to sort of get comfortable with this stuff. But something that I really want to point out that's very important is that you know, it's not just Chrome and it's not just Polymer that's doing this. This is an effort across you know, all over the community, basically. So the folks at Mozilla have been working on an element set as well, which is called Brick. And Brick is really cool because it is designed with Firefox OS in mind. So it, it has a different look than the Polymer elements. Um, but it's still meant for building mobile web applications. So I, I threw this together. This is using Brick elements. So it uses a Brick app bar up at the top. 
a brick deck in the middle for, for changing through your content, and a brick tab bar at the bottom. And what's really neat is that Brick and Polymer use the same polyfills for, for adding support to web components. And under the hood, um, or sorry, and, and if you're working with vanilla web components, they can work with, uh, with Brick and Polymer as well. So what I did was I added Polymer elements to this application from the core set. And I also added just like an element that Adi Asmani wrote for displaying like a wall of Instagram photos. So I'm, I'm just picking and choosing elements from different UI sets and combining them together, which is not something that you can really easily do today using something like Bootstrap or Foundation. And the point here is just that web components can work together, and that's really the idea, that we're building these things once, we're building you know, um, something that we can reuse across frameworks and libraries, and we're not forcing developers into silos, which is pretty awesome. And it's not just browser makers that are doing this. Um, TJ Van Toll, uh, actually a member of the jQuery UI team, started experimenting with you know, playing around with web components and porting bits and pieces over just to, just to see like, you know, how it looked, how it felt. Um, so there's a project up on GitHub. This is in no way meant for production or anything like that. This is just like a fun experiment that, that TJ has been working on. Um, but I, you know, a lot of you are familiar with jQuery UI, I'm assuming. And I want you to think about using something like the progress bar from jQuery UI, but using it as an element. Like, how would that feel? That'd be pretty nice, right? Instead of having to, you know, set up your HTML and then elsewhere in your JavaScript call the, like, method to turn your plugin into actual UI, you just use the tag and you're ready to go. It's pretty neat. Likewise, you know, with the dialog, being able to just drop a dialog on your page, maybe put the dialog inside of a template tag and pull it out, stamp it on the screen when it's time to be displayed. So lots of really cool stuff there. Um, just elsewhere in the community, uh, Eric Ringsmith, a uh, developer, created this app router element for you know, changing the, the state of your application based on the URL, which is really awesome and really handy. Adi Asmani created this element called pager, page -er -er or something, pager, yeah, for doing pagination in your application. So you hook it up to a model, and it handles just like changing the, the data that you've got displayed on screen. And uh, another developer named Ray Nicholas created this element, which I think is really cool, called Ajax form, which actually takes the form element and extends it using the custom element uh, syntax and submits forms for you using Ajax instead of forcing the page refresh. So lots of really cool stuff that developers are making. Um, now that we have this ecosystem and it's kind of flourishing, we can actually start building applications. And so I want to show some of the things that are out there that are in production. Polymer Project website. We want to make sure that we're you know, dog fooding this stuff and that if there are problems, we see them and we experience the pain. So this site is built entirely in web components. You can go and kind of like browse around and see how we did it. Chrome Status is another really great site, which uh, will not only uh, show you the, the status of web components in different browsers, but it's also built using web components, which is kind of cool. And another thing that we built, which is sort of fun, this is, to again, another total experiment. This is not really meant for production, but we built this thing called Designer, which is basically a drag and drop editor for working with web components. So over in the sidebar, I've just got a bunch of components uh, from the core set and the paper set, and I can just drag those out on the canvas and throw them inside of one another. And because these elements are sealed and they're not leaking their styles out all over the page, you can actually build drag and drop editors, and the code that they produce is really nice and really clean. GitHub, you know, a site which I'm assuming most of you are familiar with, has very recently uh, put custom elements in production. So if you go to the GitHub website and you actually look at your commit message where it says, like, committed five minutes ago, that little time tag right there is a custom element that's using the polyfills from the Polymer library. And Salesforce has taken their mobile SDK and converted it over to web components. So they have these little mobile SDK packs that they put out. In the bottom left there, you can see they put one out for Polymer. So if you use Salesforce, you're building a Salesforce app, you can actually build that in Polymer today. And what's interesting is the elements they created already know how to talk to the Salesforce backend, which is pretty cool. And it sort of opens up this whole other area, which it's not, you, you don't immediately think about this when you're thinking about web components, uh, but this idea of building APIs as elements, which is interesting to think about. So I'll show you an example here. Let's say you want to add a marker to a Google map, right? And let's say you want to use geolocation to do it. 
So think about how much code that would require. And I'll just skip ahead. It's that much code, right? Uh, it's a lot, right? It's a lot to add just like a marker to a map. In the world of web components, this becomes a single tag. With the Google Map element, you can actually just declare a Google Map on your page, and you get a map exactly as you expect it. Under the hood, this element is going out. It's loading the Google Maps API on your behalf. It's you know, creating its own container. It's styling it and everything. And if I want to configure this thing, if I want to maybe give it a latitude and longitude and center the map, then I just give it some attributes, and it centers. If I want to zoom the map in, I give it an attribute, and it zooms. So I'm just configuring this tag, and it knows what to do. Under the hood, it's communicating with the Google Maps API, but I don't have to see all that, and I, I don't have to write it all myself, which is really nice. And if I want to add a marker to this thing, like that guy up there, I can take a Google Map Marker element, give it a latitude and longitude, and just nest it inside of my Google Map. So I've just composed together this, this little map marker app. Now at Google, we have over 250 APIs, which is a lot. Uh, and so what we've been doing is going through and taking the ones that make sense and turning those into components. So components for working with Google Sheets, Street View, obviously Maps, but Calendar as well. Uh, even Google Sign-In, like doing the whole OAuth client sign-in flow uh, has been implemented as an element, which is really cool. So hopefully you're all, interested, you're all interested in this and it seems kind of appealing. How do you join in? The first thing you gotta do is you gotta keep learning. There's, like I've flown through this and barely scratched the surface of, of what's there in web components. So if you go to a site like webcomponents.org, this is kind of like a central like, like nexus of information. We take all the talks that happen, all the videos, all the articles that get written, and we try and put them all on this one site. So if you're totally new to web components, you can go here and and get started that way. If you want to play around with Polymer and some of the demos that I showed today, you can go to the Polymer Project website. Lots of stuff up there. Uh, getting started tutorial, uh, all the documentation for the core and the paper elements and samples. If you want to start building some stuff and you want to get your hands dirty, uh, we created a project called Seed Element, which is sort of like a, a little starter boilerplate to get you up and running creating your first element. So this is up on GitHub. Uh, Adi Asmani wrote a really nice guide for it, and he also recorded a video just kind of walking you through it. If you want to build like a full-blown Polymer application, we have a Yeoman generator that I'm actually maintaining right now. So if it's broken, you can just tell me. But I highly recommend trying it out, primarily because it can, you know, even if you're not like a fan of Yeoman, using the generator will show you how you can structure your project, and most importantly, how you can build it using that vulcanized tool that I showed before to concatenate all your imports together. So it's just a nice way to get familiar with um, you know, some of the best practices around structuring your app. It also includes things like SAS, uh, PageSpeed Insights, Auto Prefixer, Mocha Test, like lots of good stuff. Actually, I think Mocha Tests are on a branch right now, but it'll have those very soon. And lastly, you gotta share these things that you're building. So this community is, is new. The people that are making web components are, are you know, cranking stuff out, but it's, it's a small community and we're really trying to grow it. So a site like customelements.io is a great place to go and find stuff, but it's also a great place to share the work that you've created. If you wanna share your component on that site, all you have to do is add a keyword, web-components, to your Bower JSON, and it'll show up on webcomponents.org when you register with Bower. So the last thing is you've gotta explore, and you've gotta be willing to approach this with an open mind, because there's a lot of hard problems that we're still working on and we still haven't solved, but it's up to us, everyone in this room, everybody you know, who's, who's part of this community, it's up to us to figure out the new best practices and how to move forward with these technologies because I think that web components give us this amazing opportunity to revolutionize the mobile web. So I'm really looking forward to seeing all the stuff that you guys build. Thank you so much for, for having me out today. And if you have questions, feel free to. Oh. That would be good. I'm curious about if you um, want or need to escape from the from the uh, shadow or from the walled garden. I mean, like if uh, you know, if I wanted to 
re-theme all of my components, or if I want the events from each one to interact with each other, and that those, those ways of getting out of the box. Yeah. So I didn't show it uh, just for time constraints, but if you want to theme a component, there's actually new CSS selectors that have been added uh, as part of the Shadow DOM specs. There's ways that if you know what you're doing, you can pierce the Shadow DOM to theme things. And it's new selectors, so that way you don't accidentally theme the Shadow DOM. So it's one of those things where um, we want to make sure that the developer has the final say when it comes to the look and feel of their site. And, and so we also want to create some new selectors so that it doesn't happen accidentally. Uh, for, for events and things like that, uh, usually what I recommend is, um, you know, if you want to have a bunch of elements kind of talking to one another, it's probably best to, to kind of like delegate from like a higher, like a, like a parent or something like that, and listen for the event coming out of one of those children and then like drive the other one, versus having them talking directly, because that can start to get messy. Hodge. Leading question. Um, why all the dashes? Crap. Yes, I should have mentioned that. Uh, so every custom element needs to have a dash in its name, and that is to protect it against future versions of HTML, right? Like if I just made an element called carousel, and then a later version of HTML made an element called carousel, that would be a problem. Uh, so the dash basically instructs the browser like, hey, I'm making an HTML element. It's going to be a custom element, so kind of like let me do my thing. How, how extensible are these things? Like, um, I understand that, that uh, custom elements can be extended, like kind of like subclassing. Um, is that entirely possible? How can I reuse the behavior that someone else has implemented while modifying some of it? Totally. You know, is there a way to call super? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, again, it's something I, I kind of didn't show for the sake of time, but uh, you can inherit from other elements. Um, you can inherit from their prototype. You can extend uh, even native elements. So that Ajax form element that I showed before is actually, it's called a type extension element. That extends the native form tag. And if you want to, you can also inherit from and extend just other custom elements that people have created. If you look at uh, some of the Polymer elements, like, um, like paper tabs, the one that I was showing before, uh, we have an element called core selector, which doesn't actually display anything visual. It just manages the selected state of its children. And so we uh, inherit from that for our like tabs and, and other menu elements. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. <laughs>